Maiden voyages are the most stressful thing in radio controlled airplanes, at least to me, because you're taking something that you've spent a lot of time on or some time on, and you've got this new kind of emotional attachment to the object, the airplane, and you're going to subject it to the unknown. You don't know how that plane's going to perform, and you've got to be ready to react. Whew! God, sounds like a lot of pressure, doesn't it? Well, let me tell you how it went. Hey, welcome back to the shop. It's really good to see you here again. So yeah, the Rebel took it out for its maiden voyage. And uh, you know, maiden voyages are tough. They're just overall very hard to work with because you don't know what's gonna happen. You've built this plane, you've got the surfaces set the way you think they should be set, you've got them leveled off, all that kind of stuff. You're, you've checked the balance both laterally and also CG to make sure everything's okay. You've run the engine and, um, and it runs strong and you think you've got it tuned up right. But you should just never know what's going to happen next. And so, so let's see here. I think when I left you last time, I was showing you the Rebel. It was fully put together. I think I hadn't programmed the radio in it yet at that point. Um, I needed to make sure that all the servos were going the correct direction and all that kind of stuff. Uh, put in my exponential values and things like that. And that's about where it was. Um, what else needed to be done? Oh, we needed to do an engine test. Hadn't been run yet. So I guess let's start with there. After I left you, I took the plane over to Mark's house. He's got a engine stand, just like the ones that we use out at our field. And so I took it there, we put it on the bench and it's, it's nice. It holds the plane up off the ground so you're not leaning over to make adjustments or anything like that. We got to start it up and it was the weirdest thing. This is a DLE 30 engine brand new, out of the box. It's the first time in 30 years of modeling that I've ever had an engine that I did not make a single adjustment to. We just put gas in it, uh, primed it, and got it running. And I did not have to touch the high or low end needles whatsoever. I mean, from the factory, that's never happened. And, and really to tell you, it kind of freaked me out because I'm not used to that. I'm used to having to spend hours getting the tune right, resetting the needles back down to the to the um, defaults and then working them back. And plus, we're at 4,100 feet here, so we're way up in the air. And typically, most of these model engines, I think, are being made in places that are pretty close to sea level. So when they do their quality testing on them to make sure they ran okay, They've got a lot of oxygen, and up here at 4,150 feet, we don't have a lot of oxygen, which kind of explains the people around here sometimes. But anyways, uh, getting back to the point, uh, I was just amazed, and it ran perfectly. So <laughs> we put my engine away, or we put the airplane away, and Mark was also testing one out for himself that day, and... Uh, <laughs> His needed lots of adjustments. We spent a lot of time working on his. So that was good. We didn't have to spend a whole lot of time on mine. We spent more time on his. Everything worked out fine. The next step after that was done is to go out to the field and, and basically get ready to fly. But there's one more test that I always perform uh, before I get ready to fly, and that's a range check test. And I like to do my range check with the radio and uh, with, the, with the engine actually running. Because if you do that, you're gonna detect if there's some kind of problems, like uh, for instance, this DLE has a solid state ignition on it. And so if the solid state ignition causes some kind of uh, interference problem, then it's gonna show up, the surfaces will bounce and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so had to do that, and it cleared that with flying colors. Um, I used the, uh, my radio, this is, I think I showed you this last time, this is a Tandem 18. 
from FR Sky. And it's got a part in here so that you can do a range check. And what it does is it pretty much lowers the transmission uh, output signal so that it's simulating, you know, it's being in rougher conditions, the signal will be more, more vulnerable. And so I walked off, I think about a hundred feet. And then I um, went ahead and, and put this into what they call, what's it called? What's it called? It's called, um, I just could just call range check, I think. And so it cuts the signal and I had no problems with it. So with that all done, we got started. Start. Live. You on? Okay. Well, here it is. Moment of truth. We did uh, a test for range on the radio, and that looked good. And when, then we did a test with the engine running, that also looked good. So I think we've run out of excuses not to fly. Here we are. How long did it take me to build this plane, Mark? Too long. Too long. I think it was two years. Too many. Too many moves involved. It's supposed to take three weeks. <laughs> it always starts off that way. But anyways, uh, next step now is we'll go ahead and fire it up and uh, see how she runs on the runway and then in the sky. It's gonna Yay. happen, it's gonna happen out there. Yeah, if it's gonna happen, <laughs> it's gonna happen out there. Thank you, Captain Ron. All right. Now, before I show you the next scenes here, I want to kind of let you in on it to kind of explain here. Um, I'm not real big on radio control photography or videography because it, it's like if you've ever been to a full scale air show and you, you just you get a real appreciation for what your human eyes can do to see a plane or something coming by and then magnify it in your mind the way it should be. Because if you ever like go to shoot pictures of a plane or something like that that's in the sky, like at an air show, you get in your mind, it looks like, oh, plane. But what it looks like is sky and little plane. And that's what it ends up being. And so RC photography is even harder because the planes are even smaller. And a lot of the times with the cameras that I use, well, first of all, I'm not the one shooting. I have to have somebody else shoot. They might not be familiar with my equipment. And then there's even been times when I've been shooting with my equipment and the plane is so small and the camera often has a lot of trouble trying to focus on something. And, it, and it, you can get those big old honking, you know, those big uh, lenses that are like 600 millimeter or whatever. And you might be able to get it into the screen, but if it goes to the, out of the screen, suddenly you're like searching all over the place. It's like, searching with a little tiny flashlight trying to light up something so you got to zoom back out and then zoom back in and it's hideous and most of the rc uh videos that i see where somebody is flying a plane for the first time they all look the same to me the plane goes off takes off the runway climbs up into the sky and then climbs up to the point where it proceeds to turn into a little tiny dot you really can't see what's going on very well with it and so so what I've done is um, I've tried to get Mark to shoot pictures specifically of the plane. Um, you know, I, there is some that are far off, but most of the time what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get him to shoot the plane going down the runway, getting airborne. And then uh, like I'll come by on a low pass. So we'll be able to get the whole low pass in maybe one or two of those. And then, you know, landing. So I didn't spend an exorbitant amount of time shooting plane at little dot. I just, I just don't get into that. I would, um, and I just, I don't know, to me, it's like, I can't tell you how many times you see a video. It's like, oh, here's a guy, he's going to fly this jet or this something. And you really expect it to be something spectacular, but they all end up looking the same. Oh, kind okay, of little tiny dot. So that's why we didn't shoot a whole lot of footage of this. Um, what I'm going to show you today is actually the day that we went out at our local field and we shot the maiden voyage. And then there's also a couple of other, two other times that we've flown this plane that uh, I had Mark shoot some more footage so that we would just have more for filler and stuff like that. But um, anyways, here you go. Ready? Yep.
fly for a while? I'm shaky. No, I'm good. <laughs> Oh, I don't care how many test planes you've ever flown for the first time. It always does that on the first one. Oh my God. But man, that was pretty uneventful. Uh, everything trimmed out pretty well. I just needed to add a little bit of up elevator and a slight bit of, uh, which way did I go? Had to go right aileron uh, to get this thing pretty much set right. Uh, it's so good to have this thing done. And then the last step, once the plane is down and landed and, and everything is good in the world and you're just totally dosed out with adrenaline and shaking and all that kind of stuff, then that's the true moment where you get to put the plane away or you know decide if you're going to fly it again. What I like to do is if I am maidening a plane, I will maiden fly the plane, get it up there, get happy with the uh, different parts of it, such as the... Um, getting it all trimmed out, maybe doing some basic maneuvers and just trying to get the feel for the plane because this is the first time you've ever flown a plane uh, that, you know, it, it, if it's a maiden, it's the first time you've ever flown the plane. You don't have a real feel for it. And so it takes a while to get that feel. And, and feel isn't really feel, but you start to get kind of a, I wouldn't say it's muscle memory, but something kind of like that so that you get used to exactly how that plane is gonna respond with your typical stick movements. And that comes in time, but you spend the time on that first flight trying to get all that down. And then of course, the most difficult part is bringing it back for the landing. The landing is, you know, what they say is takeoffs are, are uh, optional, but landings are mandatory. It's gonna come down one way or another, so. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is I get really shaky on that first flight. I don't care if it's a plane that you've only had for a short period of time. It spent a lot of time with you while you were building it. You know, even if it's an ARF or something like that and you didn't spend as much time, you get kind of attached to the plane. And that's what causes the adrenaline to just kind of pulse through you. And, you know, as, uh, there was several times toward the end there when I was getting ready, I was shooting the landing. So I go down to the downwind, turn on to the uh, uh, starting to turn base onto final. And I could feel my thumb shaking. I mean, it, luckily, I put enough expo into my uh, throws on there so that even if the stick is moving a little bit, it's not going to move it. So it comes down. It doesn't look like this flying through the air. Hey, look at there's Dan. <laughs> so, um that's something that I tend to do is put a lot of expo in there. It'll soften up that middle until I can finally get that thing adjusted correctly. Um, but anyways, once we get down and get it on the ground, I tend to take and put it away for the day. Um, I only like to do, I, I usually don't like to do two flights if the maiden happened that day, because what I want to do after the maiden is get it back to the shop so I can go over every screw on it, make sure that all the servo screws are okay, that I take a look under the uh, wing to see if anything vibrated around down in there, if everything's still hooked up correctly. Um, I always figure every time that you land the plane that, you know, you got lucky and it, it, if you have a chance to go through it and make sure that everything was okay, then, then it was solid. But I've had some times where We've flown the plane and I brought it back in and, uh, you know, you find like a screw like halfway sticking up out of the there. There's a lot of vibration, especially with these uh, chainsaw motors in there. And they'll kind of knock stuff loose after a while. But anyways, this was a great uh, way to end this series with the Rebel. I mean, I'm going to be flying it now. It's going to be my kick around airplane. So I've got to get to know it better. I've got actually about four flights on it at this point. And I want to get to know it better so it could become my easy starter plane. Um, as you progress with running the plane, more things are going to happen. So, for instance, on the fourth flight, the cap on that wonderful gas tank that I showed you, I didn't put it on tight enough. And so <laughs> I go to start the plane up and notice that there is fuel leaking out of the wheel, uh, out of the servo for the uh, rudder. 
So some of the gas had gotten out of it. And fortunately, we figured it out, shut it all down, got all the gas out of it, cleaned it all out, reset that neck on the bottle. So tighten that sucker down like a gorilla. Okay, that's my advice to you. But it's one of those kind of things you learn over time. There's going to be a lot of different um, things with use that are going to happen. Parts are going to loosen up. So it's always good to kind of go back over the plane and make sure everything's okay. But uh, I want to thank everybody for sticking with me on this series. Uh, I've got a bunch of other planes and projects coming up. Want to talk a little bit about that radio. Uh, I've had a couple of requests from some of the viewers to go into depth on that. Um, it's a nice radio system, but I like weird radio systems. I don't know if you'll like it. Um, the standard radio system out there is... I would say nowadays it's Spectrum is probably the number one system. When I was starting off in this, it was Futaba and Airtronics and JR, and those were the big companies. And now I don't know where Futaba is anymore. I think they're still out there. Uh, but it's just all of these companies have got different participation rate, rates here in the States. So um, I like different types of radio systems. I'll go into that at some point down the road. Uh, I've also... I am planning on bringing one of my scale airplanes in here uh, to get working on it. It is partially done and it's in that storage unit. And uh, there's just some other things that I want to share with you. I'm also working on a set of floats for Mark. I look over there because they're over there. You can't see them. But uh, I'm working on, uh, he's got a set of floats here and he wants me to fiberglass them. So I'm going to fiberglass them using uh, West Systems Epoxy. And uh, that's coming up. So thanks for being with me on this one thanks for all your support and all your questions and all your you know all the all the great feedback i've had from in the comments and please keep sending them to me i love going over the comments and i try to get back to them as as fast as i can and all that kind of stuff sometimes i sit there and just blaze away on the telephone you know because i can see your comments in the in my youtube studio thing so i can get back to you quickly that way and I've become quite a typist with the phone. It's crazy. But uh, thanks for coming in today, and um, I'll see you next time. Oh, yes. Yeah, see, mine always does that. Nice. Nice job, Marcus. Good job, Mark. Good.